This is California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Scott Svonkin, he is a member of the Los Angeles Community College District, a trustee. And so I want to speak with you about community colleges in California. I was shocked to learn that in 1984, up to 1984, community colleges were free. Right. They're not free anymore. And in fact, we are seeing tremendous spikes in tuition at community colleges. Talk to us about that. Well, the legislature sets the price that students pay across the state. So every community college is charges the same thing. Um, and unfortunately, since I went to community college many years ago, um, it was $50 to take a full load. Now it's $50 a unit. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna get higher if the Proposition 30 doesn't pass and it's gonna make it harder and harder for people to go to college. And let's talk about Proposition 30. That, of course, is the governor's initiative. Mm -hmm. It would increase sales tax by a quarter cent for four years, taxes on the wealthy for seven years. As we speak today, and the election's right around the corner, Prop 30's lead is tenuous at best, which is interesting given that we have seen draconian cuts mm -hmm. to K-12, K-14, UC, CSU, and of course, I'm not taking a position, but it is interesting that that's where we are as we speak today. Well, I think the voters haven't come to understand yet that Proposition 30 will help the community colleges, the UCs, and the CSUs. They help all of the systems, including K-12. So if you believe in public education or public safety, Proposition 30 is uh, simple, Yes, vote. And so what you're describing, and I'll say it for you, Prop 38, the other, quote, tax initiative, its money would only go to K-12. Correct. Um, that's the challenge is, is that a single, very wealthy businesswoman decided, lawyer, decided to try to help K-12. And she left everything else out um, except trying to deal with the state's uh, deficit. So the Prop 38 helps K-12 and the state's deficit. Prop 30 helps K-12, community colleges, Cal States, and UCs, as well as it helps law enforcement. And that is critical because it helps make sure that people can go to college it makes sure that the K-12 gets money and that our police and fire. But let's talk about the law enforcement angle because I do see that that issue has gotten a bit lost. As you know, we had a realignment scheme passed mm -hmm. whereby lower level offenders are serving their time in county jails, uh, county, pr you know, county jails, jails instead not of prison. state prisons. Yes. And so what Prop 30 does is it firms up that funding stream from Sacramento to the counties. Correct. It makes sure that local law enforcement has money to take care of inmates that are low-level offenders, and it allows them to provide programs so they can transition from jails back into the community. Whereas Prop 38, all it does is help our, our K-12 system. But let's look at the dynamic of November 6th. What we will see, for example, in Los Angeles County, is we will see Prop 30, we will right. see Prop 38. Mm -hmm. We will see Measure R, which will extend the transportation tax an right. additional 30 years, even though that tax was just passed four years ago. Right. We also know the Amazon tax is kicked in. Mm -hmm. The lumber tax is about to kick in, the fire tax is kicking in. There, all, there are a lot of taxes before us right now. Right. Um, and that doesn't even account for, a, Culver City has a, a sales tax before its voters. I mean, there's a lot going on in terms of uh, um, elected officials and governments seeking funding from voters. Yeah, well, I think the voters need to decide what is important to them. To me, Proposition 30 is personal. I have two small kids in public school. Um, community college turned my life around. And because those things, those dreams and those opportunities for a better future are linked in my mind to Prop 30 and none of the other initiatives. There isn't an initiative on the ballot I think is more important to the future of California than vote, voting yes on Prop 30. And those are strong words because I have asked others, is this really a turning point? Is this a moment in time a la 1978 when Prop 13 passed, where we can say what happened on Prop 30 really changed the face of our state. Well, I think so, because the Los Angeles community colleges are going to have to lock out, not accept, reduce our classes, and reduce about $50 million if Prop 30 doesn't pass. That'll affect thousands of people's future. It'll affect those that are going to community college and those that want to. And so for the 
for the viewers that care about public education, Prop 30 is the most important thing on the ballot. And what's interesting is that the Cal State system sent out a letter right. uh, to all of its applicants telling them that if Prop 30 does not pass, they will be admitting, I think it was 20,000 fewer students. Right. Some got angry that that was a political statement. Others said, it's just a fact. Right. So are these scare tactics or is this a legitimate reality? I mean, if Prop 30 doesn't pass, couldn't the legislature just go back and rejigger and figure this out somehow? Well, for in our case, in community colleges, if Prop 30 doesn't pass, they could go back for next year and raise tuition, but that still shuts people out. $50 a unit, cheap, but not free. California, the dream was everybody had a place at community college. Unfortunately, less and less people are being able to get in. And because of the cuts in funding, we can accept less and less students because th we have all these students trying to get their classes and thousands every well, day can't. As I understand it, in this fall, fall 2012, I think it was 85% of all community college students reported being on at least one waiting list for a class. Right. At least one. Yeah. A and that begs the question, you know, California community colleges had been known for matriculating students from community college to Cal State, USC, Correct. wherever it is, but yet they're not matriculating quickly enough because they can't get their classes. Right, it is, it's unfortunate. The, the facts that it takes students longer to get through raises the cost because you have both the cost of the education and you have a cost of living. And virtually all our students at community colleges are working people. They're not the average 18 year old being supported by their parents any longer. That's a thing of the past. But could it be that we just need to say to ourselves, this is the California that the voters want? You know, the voters had a chance, for example, to pass a cigarette tax mm -hmm. in June. Right. Um, these are not voters in Kentucky or South Carolina. These are Californians. Right. And whether that was a good initiative or not, I've, you know, I'm not commenting, but they said no to a cigarette tax. We have not passed a statewide tax since 2004. So could it be it's just this is what Californians want, and as a result, this is what we're going to get? I don't think so. I think that if voters are informed about the consequences and the opportunities around the propositions, they'll do the right thing. This is a presidential year, so you have President Obama on the ballot. You'll, the voters that turned down the cigarette ca the cigarette tax are very different but, than today's but, voter. But remember, I mean, the same year that President Obama took 61% of the vote in California, the same voting pool voted um, in favor of Proposition 8, which um, banned marriage between members of the same sex. Again, not commenting, but, you know, Californians speak loudly and clearly. And, you know, it may be a good, quote, Democratic year, but non-democratic things, big D can happen. Right. I think you're right. I'm hopeful that the voters will understand that the future of our state is, at, is, is in play now. The future of public education, the future of public safety. If Proposition 30 doesn't pass, the consequences will be dire. And it's not, these are not like scare tactics or threats. These are, this is the reality is the state has less money today and so we've got to make a decision. Do we want to fund public education or do we want to have less available in education? And that's the voters' decision. It's not my decision. What are voters telling you? Well, I think the fact is, is the, the students and the people I run into every day on our campuses are, are optimistic that their families and friends will vote for it. But are they voting? I mean, you know, voter turnout amongst 18 to 25 year olds has not been very high historically. Well, we have been trying in the community colleges and on the CSUs and UCs to register uh, more voters because students have a stake in this. These are people whose futures are on the line. And so I'm hopeful that we'll see, in, at least in Los Angeles and in California, an increase in young voters. But the, the economy is dependent upon our colleges and universities. So we've got to do better. We'll see election day right around the corner. His name is Scott Svonkin. He is a member of the Los Angeles Community College District. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We'll be right back on California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Renata Cooper, she is the president of Pasadena Unified School District, and I thank you for joining us. And I see you have a button on it says yes on 38. Eight. Yes, Not sir. yes on 30, yes on 38. So let's talk about 30 and 38. Why are you such a strong supporter of 38? I'm a strong supporter of 38 because it brings the most resources to our school district. It brings resources directly to the school sites and it is restorative in, its, in what it does. It attempts to take us back to the funding levels of uh, 2007. Who knew what a golden era that year was? It, what you are saying is true. Mm -hmm. It is 100% true that 38 does provide more money to K-12 than 30. And it's not just filling gaps, it's actually bringing back funding. What some would say though, is while that's you know a, an a admirable goal, that's all 38 does. And it really sets up this money into a lockbox. And it's kind of that ballot box budgeting that has been part of the problem we faced in California. How would you respond to those concerns? Well, I think it's all ballot box budgeting. And I think it's really unfortunate that we are here. I think it's really unfortunate that the governor and the legislature can't get their act together and do a, do a better job in terms of creating a budget that works for our, for our state. And I think it is shameful that we are now 47th out of 50 states and that if both of these initiatives uh, fail, we will be someone until we'll be 50th. And I said, no, no, we'll be 51 because we'll also be behind right. the DC. District of Columbia. So, you know, I think how far California has fallen is really tragic. But at the same time, I believe that uh, I'm elected member of the Pasadena Unified School District Board of Education and my primary focus has to be the education of the children in our K in the K-12 system. And that's key because what 38 does uh, not do that 30 does is there's no 13 and 14 funding in 38. Meaning community colleges don't see any funding under 38, they would under 30. There is There are funds that would be freed up from 30 because the first three years of 38 uh, thirty percent of the funding goes to pay the educational bond debt mm -hmm. and that would free up money in the general fund that could be d directed towards uh, the community colleges, towards but the Cal UC do you system. trust Sacramento to free it up in such a way that the money will go to community you colleges? You know what, I believe that if the, if the funds are freed up it is, it is the responsibility of those entities to advocate effectively for that funding. It's responsibility of students, parents, faculty organizations, the lobby, the lobbying organizations to see to it that that money gets put to their, uh, the, the, the Cal, the UC, and the community sure. college system. I, I think it's unfortunate that it, that we have to have that concern, that, that, you know, the whole issue of trust. I think people need to let their legislators know if, if 38 passes, which I sincerely hope it does, that this is how you want the funding that's freed up to use, that you don't want it to go, let's say you don't want it to go into prisons, you know, you want it to go into education. Are you concerned also by the fact that under Prop 38, the income tax hike applies to everyone? Now, one could argue that seems very fair, um, and it is done on a sliding scale upward in terms of income. But look, I mean, these are tough times, and should we be taxing everyone during these tough fiscal times? I think that the, the tax, the tax uh, distribution in Prop 38 is fair, and it is equitable, and people who are at the lower end do not pay, pay nothing or a very negligible, to very, very negligible mm -hmm. amount of taxes increase that you would actually see. And every time I am faced with, with a tax challenge and, and it, something is going to increase my taxes and I look at what, what is it, and, I, and I'm not, I have no wealth, I, I work for a living. Uh, and school board work is kind of volunteer work because I get, you know, you don't really get paid for doing that. I always look at the amount and then, it, and then, I, and then I just stop a minute and think about, okay, how much money do I waste in a month? Mm -hmm. How much just gets away from me that I don't even get, get a good handle on? And that always helps me to balance things out. I think that part of living in a civilized society is that there, there, you do have to pay taxes, and 
to, to pay for certain goods and services. And I can think of no good or service that's more important for the education of our children. I do want to ask you about Prop 30 because you are also a supporter of Prop 30. Yes, I'm kind of, yes, <laughs> yes. <you laughs> oh, know, okay, kind of thing, I hear because, because we desperately need one of them to pass. And 30 would be better than nothing. Uh, because nothing, it would just be devastating for our district and, let's and all districts. And let's talk about that, because if you look at the mood of Californians, they tend to vote yes on local tax or bond initiatives. They haven't voted yes on statewide tax initiatives as of late. We had a cigarette tax on the ballot in June. I'm not talking to you as a reporter mm. living in Kentucky or North Carolina, mm. and yet the cigarette tax failed. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a concern with what we see at the polls today that both 30 and 38 could lose. Tell me what that would mean for Pasadena Unified and for public education generally in our state of California. In Pasadena, it would, we're looking at probably $17.8 million in cuts. And what does that mean as a percentage? I mean, is that 17 million out of 100 million? Is that 17 million out of 200 million? What it means is, because I, I, I want to put it into a frame of reference Please. that anyone can understand. What it means is a shorter school year. I have wrestled with this in my mind, and I have always struggled as an educator, uh, as a lifelong educator who now serves on a school board in the midst of really trying times. I see no way around this. You're not uh, alone. W without, without actually making some cuts uh, to the academic year, which would be tragic from my perspective because I know that our school, our academic year in, in this country is already the shortest in the Western industrialized world. To the point where I've actually been thinking about, okay, how would we actually do it? And one of the things that I, I, I mentioned to our superintendent, I said, maybe if we have to cut if we have to cut the school year, maybe we could go to eliminating school on Fridays instead of just taking weeks out. Because one of the things when you eliminate an entire week, you have, uh, you, you know, you boost the possibility of kids losing information that they've gained. What would that mean for families in Pasadena, in California, if we eliminated Fridays, let's say? You know, I think about childcare. It's going to be increased childcare costs. It's going to be very inconvenient. Uh, and families will have to do some rescheduling and some reshuffling to figure out. But I think I think making taking Fridays off is probably easier than stopping school two or three weeks early because then you're having to make arrangements for an entire week, two weeks, three weeks. I know there's as 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 opposed to what can we what what can we do on Fridays? And I think. I think ours would not be the only district that's struggling with this, but there's going to have to be a reduction of time. There's just kind of no way around it. Now, I, you know, this is just me thinking and brainstorming about how we do it. I have no idea uh, how the, the teachers union would feel about doing it that way, and they would have to be in agreement to, to, to making the change in this way. But it seems to me, in terms of academic retention, retention of subject matter, which is the most important things in terms of working with the children that doing having Fridays off would be better for them and their retention than uh, than, than, elim is, is than eliminating a, weeks. Is this a turning point for California? I think the point's already turned. I think now it's it's just kind of a how bad are we going to let this be? How bad are we going to let this be? Uh, we are already 47th, which is nothing to be proud of. And it's very difficult for me to thinking of, you know, being a native Californian and thinking about how proud Californians are of our state. It's very difficult for me to think of anything that Californians would be okay with being 47th out of 51, that we would think, look at that, particularly if we used to be in the top 10, that we'd look at that and say, oh, yeah, that's okay. We can handle being 47th. Uh, so why are we, as we speak today, S looking at polls that say that Prop 30 is barely passing and Prop 38 is in trouble. What, what's happening? If I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, maybe it's just the fatigue of it all, the economic fatigue, mm -hmm. and uh, a concern about what, how it affects me. It is true that in, if you think of public education that only uh, a third of people right. typically have a of child course. in the school. Her the name schools. is Renata Cooper. She is the president of Pasadena Unified School District. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Jay Chen, he's a trustee on the Hacienda La Puente School Board. He's also a candidate for the United States Congress in a very interesting district. It covers three different counties. Tell us about the district. Sure. The district includes Los Angeles County, Orange County, and San Bernardino. Twelve cities. Um, How did all. that happen? I thought the new redistricting commission was supposed to make it more clean. Yeah, you know, you would have thought that they would have um, observed certain lines. They were supposed to keep cities together, right. communities of interest they could consider. And you would have thought that counties would be factored right. in. But for whatever reason, they, they grouped this uh, district together So like give that. us a sense of the geography of the district. Sure. So it's got Hacienda Heights, Roland Heights, Walnut, Diamond Bar, and uh, La Habra Heights, that's LA County. I mean, just there, diverse communities in terms diverse. of ethnic diversity, but also economic diversity. Yes, so in terms of uh, uh, the, the ethnic diversity, the district is 30% Asian, 29% mm. Latino. So, you know, it's a very interesting district. So tell us about the Orange County side and the San Bernardino side. So in Orange County, we've got uh, La Habra, Buena Park, Fullerton, Brea, Placentia, and Dorba Linda. Okay. And then in San Bernardino, we've got Chino Hills. Just Chino Hills, but Chino right. Hills is very, very large. And very, very affluent. <laughs> very affluent, exactly. and, and so it really is quite diverse economically. Right. Talk to us about your race. I mean, it's a very different race than Hacienda La Puente School Board. Right. Obviously, uh, more voters, a lot more voters. Mm -hmm. As you walk around the district, what are you hearing from voters of all types? Well, it's a very diverse district. One thing I want to point out, a very interesting fact is that within the borders of the 39th, we have the largest Buddhist temple in the Western Hemisphere. Really? Shilai that's interesting. Temple. And then in Chino Hills, we have the, lar the second largest Hindu temple that's being built. Who knew? Yeah. And then we've got a Jain temple in uh, Buena Park, uh, two Gurdwaras, an Islamic center, and also a synagogue. So it's a very interesting district, and we've really, uh, I think people there are very interested in seeing someone fresh and new uh, running to represent them. And I think it's fair to say the district is a challenging one for a Democrat. It's yes. not to say that you can't pull it out, but I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say it's the district is has more registered Republicans and Democrats, but be that as it may, um, just as a neutral observer, you seem to be making noise. I mean, that's what I see. I just kind of watch the landscape. Mm -hmm. How have you been able to make so much noise? Well, I think one thing that works in my favor is, uh, uh, yo puedo hablar español. Ah, muy bien. Sí. Mm -hmm. y, y Exactamente. <laughs> you speak Mandarin as well. Yes. So how is it? I presume you're of Chinese or Taiwanese descent. My parents are from Taiwan. Okay. Uh -huh. So where does the Spanish come in? Well, you know, my mom, when she was a, after she graduated from college, she went to Spain for a year and studied Spanish. Okay. So you got this, you know, 62-year-old little Chinese lady right. who speaks Spanish. She's okay. my best Spanish uh, volunteer. I love Spanish-speaking volunteer. But still, you learned Spanish, not just from your mom. No. So I went to uh, Mexico right after I graduated from high school. And then I wrote for a travel guide called Let's Go. Oh, sure. I know it. So a lot of backpackers use it. And I covered Belize, Honduras, Guatemala. Then I went to Bolivia and Chile. And then I also worked at the U.S. Embassy in Costa Rica. Wow. Can I just tell you as a side note, so I speak English, obviously. I learned French. I spoke French very well. Mm -hmm. I've decided I want to learn a third language, and that is Spanish. It is so hard to learn a language, A, in your 40s. Right. But more importantly, that's similar enough to French. Right. I wish my third language was Chinese, for example. It'd uh -huh. be easier because it'd be so different from French. Yeah, no mistaking. Yeah, no mistaking. So, um, so how are Latino voters connecting? Because... Look, this is a different day, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they appreciate your ability to speak Spanish, but what are they saying to you? It's, it's, it's kind of like, can I use this cliche? They're the sleeping dragon. <laughs> and if I can use that cliche, I mean, in a lot of ways, they're yeah. the sleeping dragon of politics today. They really are. And, you know, we saw what happened with Loretta Sanchez when she had this huge right. upset over Bob Dornan, and that happened because of the Latino vote. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in my district, there's a lot of Latinos in the Orange County area who haven't really had a candidate that was campaigning to them. And as you know, Orange County is much more conservative. You know, there's a lot of support for Prop although, 187. Although the communities you list don't feel as if, I mean, a couple of them are conservative hotbeds, but don't feel as mm -hmm. if it's kind of the, the heart and soul of conservative Orange County. Am I right? Well, we do have uh, Richard Nixon's uh, birthplace. But would Richard but Nixon be a Republican today? I'm I just asking. I don't know. That's a I very good point. I don't, I don't think he'd fit in the party. Right. That one could argue. One yeah. could argue. Um, so you are a veteran, I believe. Are you yes. still serving? I'm in the U.S. Navy Reserves right And now. so talk to me about 
what the, what you bring in that vein, having been, did mm -hmm. you serve active duty? No, I have not been okay. activated. It's all good. Yeah. But what do you bring to the table in terms of military service, and how does that inform you? Well, you know, today, less than 1% of the population in the United States is uh, involved in the U.S. military, true. which is very different from before. And, uh, you know, but we're still, we've uh, been in the longest war uh, in U.S. history. The right. Afghan war is considered the longest. So I think there's a lot of people who are removed from the actual uh, sacrifices that are being made. And I think more people should be serving. You know, in Taiwan, it's automatic. Uh, you have to serve in mm -hmm. Korea as well. Right. Israel. In Israel, right. definitely. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we could benefit from more elected officials with that experience. So what I bring is an understanding of, you know, what are some of the concerns within it's, the military. It's interesting. I remember when I was in 12th grade, in my government class, the teacher had us all stand up and he started listing qualifications. Mm -hmm. We didn't know he was listing qualifications to be president, uh -huh. or attributes, I should say. Mm -hmm. And one of them was having served in the military. This right. was in the 80s, and every prior president had been in the military, and right. so the whole class wound up sitting down. But now we do have presidents that mm -hmm. have not actively served in the military. So yeah. it's interesting you say that. I mean, it's gonna be more and more without be. conscription. Right. I mean, people have talked about whether we need to look at conscription. What uh -huh. do you think? Well, you know, I think everyone should share, share in the burden of national defense and national security. And I think it would make people think twice before they did some saber rattling. If they had served themselves or if they have a son or daughter who's actually going to have to carry out that order, I think it would be very different. We would not So would be, you support conscription or something to consider? I would support um, some kind of, uh, I, would in, I would support increased service, uh, maybe not four years, but maybe two years after you graduate. Uh, whether that's in the military, whether it's you go into a teaching profession, teaching field, right. or some kind of volunteer. Out of the box, no doubt about it. I definitely would. Um, so let's talk about world affairs. If you should be elected, obviously mm -hmm. that will be part of your ballywick. Uh, challenging times right now in the Middle East. We had a lot of excitement surrounding the Arab Spring. Right. But we know it hasn't gone as well as hoped in countries like Syria. Right. There's dissension in Libya. Right. Um, you know, is Egypt keeping the peace with its mm -hmm. alleged peace partner, Israel? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's very interesting what's playing out right now. And uh, I think the United States is, is, is doing the right thing by encouraging, um, you know, encouraging people to, to speak their mind. The Arab Spring is a good thing. It's not going to pan out exactly as we want, mm -hmm. but I think we have more legitimacy as a country if we are not supporting dictators that uh, the general population doesn't support. No, it's interesting. We look at Libya, and I, th I mean, it's obvious. We did as much as we could to try to help the revolutionaries topple right. Muammar Gaddafi. Uh -huh. In Syria, we're not doing that. Yeah. And I wonder whether we should be. I mean, yeah. what's happening in Syria, it is a travesty. Right. I mean, tens of thousands of Syrians are dying, mm -hmm. and we haven't done anything. Right. Well, I guess one of the big concerns is if we arm the rebels, what's going to happen afterwards? Mm -hmm. And will those weapons be turned against Israel? I think that's a huge concern when, you know, we've been involved in other wars where the things that we left up behind ended up being used against us. I mean, even Osama bin Laden, right? You know, at one point, he, he was, was someone, an ally. He was an ally. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful what kind of uh, footprint we leave behind. And what about Iran? Mm -hmm. I mean, Israel is shaking in its boots right. over the possibility that Iran could go nuclear. Are we right. doing enough? Are we siding with Israel strongly enough? You know, I think the, the sanctions are working. I think it's uh, important that we keep putting the international pressure on and that we make it broader. We get all the countries uh, bought in to this process, including China. Uh, and I think that's, that's the direction we have to go. We can't take any options off the table, obviously, mm -hmm. but I don't think the United States can afford another uh, major military conflict in the Middle East, and I don't think it's gonna help Israel either. So I think this uh, direction that we're pushing right now is something supported by Rami as well as uh, Obama, and it's something we should pursue. Most importantly, how are you doing? You're a recent newlywed. I know your wife for a few years. How's it going? How's the race? The race, you know, this is our honeymoon. It's an extended <laughs> oh honeymoon. Oh my, poor Karen. <laughs> but I <laughs> promised her a real one afterwards. But right. you know, we got married. We said, you know, our honeymoon's gonna be visiting the Nixon Library, going to the Fullerton Arboretum. Not you know, so bad. Yeah, not too bad. I so she's, she's amazing. She, she used to is. work for John Chung, she and she's taught me everything that I know about I politics. Know that. His name is Jay Chen. He is a candidate for the United States Congress. The election is on November 6th. My name is Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.